Parkville, Ohio. I've been in recovery for nine years, clean and sober from alcohol and other substances. I'm grateful to be here. So I grew up in Hartville, Ohio. I have two younger brothers. My mom managed public housing here in Canton, mm -hmm. and then my dad was an architect for Goodyear. Mm -hmm. So we had everything we needed and a lot of what we wanted. They were really good providers. My dad and I had a really tough relationship growing up. He was a military guy from a military family, and I'm the fourth, he's the third. We have the same name, so he had very high expectations for me. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he's very accomplished in a lot of respects. And um, I, uh, I realized I developed some character defects and some coping skills due to our relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to like uh, stay out of his way because he could be emotionally and sometimes physically abusive. And so like I learned to just overcompensate. If he asked me to do 10, I'd do 12. And um, I realized like I didn't, the only emotions I really felt like I was allowed to show was either happy or angry. I only tried to fight fight him one time and that was a terrible idea. He was much, he's just much bigger than me. He's like 6'4", 220 mm -hmm. when I was little. But at the time I'm still like smaller than him, but it's not, uh, and you know, something I found in working through recovery when I made amends with him was he did really good for the dad that he had. And um, I didn't, I didn't know that as like a child, you know, I just thought he was, cause he was, he was baffling to me in the respect that he could be so loving and supportive in some areas of it with us. And then it was like, it would just flip and he could just be very cruel at times. And, um, you know, it was hard to suss that out as a child, but now, because I've gotten older and become a father myself, like I see like there's a lot of demands put on you mm -hmm. and uh, he had a lot of demands on him and the example he had set for him was not good. So he did really well for what he was given. Yeah. In hindsight, I see now. Yeah. Yeah. As I grew up, I channeled a lot of my frustrations into sports in school and I did well in school. I did well in sports. Um, looking at when I look back on it, I think it's weird that I got along with everyone in school. So like I got along with the jocks, the burnouts, the geeks, and but I never had a group I would say was that I belonged to. And I never had best friends. I always had close friends, but I didn't want anybody to know the real me because mm -hmm. I feel there was a ton of insecurity. Just mm -hmm. I never felt good enough, tall enough, strong enough, smart enough, fast enough. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found areas like baseball was an area I really excelled in, and I enjoyed that tremendously. Um, okay. So about how old were you when you started to experiment with drugs and alcohol? 13. Yeah, I remember it vividly. I was in, we'd gotten to go to a pretty cool tournament in Chicago for baseball, and the right fielder in between, we were staying at the hotel, and he asked me if I wanted to smoke weed, and I thought, yeah, like I want to try it. and so. I remember it being like starting this equation of William plus like marijuana at that time like it gave me that peace of mind like that freedom from insecurity and uh, that peace that I was really craving that I could just be myself and mm -hmm. I spent another 13 years like trying to figure that equation out mm -hmm. and, yeah and then after that um, the following year uh, I broke my ankle uh, playing basketball and I got prescribed uh, Vicodin and Percocet, and I found out that I liked them a lot. And my friend showed me how to do other things with them mm -hmm. that made them even more fun. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really experience any consequences from either of those. Like I was still able to be on a roll, captain of the baseball team, and still able to do all the things that I thought were expected of me. So I didn't really see it as being an issue. Like my two goals growing up were to be a professional baseball player or be, become a doctor. And I was blessed enough with the opportunity to go play baseball in college and have a scholarship to pursue those things. And when I got to school, like the baseball team was not cool with me smoking weed, but I wasn't gonna tell them about the other stuff. So I learned how to drink in a very short period of time. And I didn't see it, I see it in hindsight now. Like I'm just differently, different than nine out of 10 pe people I meet on the street. Like I just, process things differently and I drink really, really heavily. I had an opportunity to go play some uh, baseball in the summertime and um, I, uh, I had some trials with the Reds and the Brewers and I felt like I had like the path I wanted and I was introduced to cocaine. And in 
nine months, I'd given up my scholarship. I dropped out of school. I broke up with my girlfriend. I quit my job and I moved to Fort Myers, Florida to pursue the Scarface lifestyle. Wow. I thought I'd seen the movie and it turned out good for him. Why not for me, mm -hmm. you know? So, <laughs> so a like-minded friend and I moved to Fort Myers, Florida and, uh, and I had this demise of like my soul and my spirit down there. And it was, I remember one night I was just at a place where I didn't like the things I was doing. And I remember looking in the mirror and it was like somebody had taken a melon baller to my insides and just carved out anything that was good. And then the rest, they just burned out. Mm -hmm. And I was a shell of a human being. And I didn't understand necessarily why I kept doing the things I did because I hurt people, I manipulated people, and um, I didn't know how I'd gotten to that place. I knew those things were wrong, but it seemed like a means to an end. And uh, I moved back to Ohio. Um, we'd pissed off our Cuban uh, connection and we were on the wrong side with them. And also Lee County Sheriff's Office, we were on the wrong side with them. So I flew out of there really quickly and I came back and I didn't know this till I was about a year sober, but my dad said when he picked me up from the airport that I could have walked right by him and he wouldn't have recognized me because wow. I'd lost like 35 pounds. Wow. And I went from being in pretty good shape playing college ball and like taking care of myself. And I always think I was like 132 pounds when mm -hmm. I came back. And um, I was like a skeleton of a man, like not only physically, but just emotionally. And, um, and at this point I was, uh, I would drink a bottle of whiskey and then however much dilated and meth I wanted yeah. in a day. And yeah. my goal was really to get uh, messed up twice in one day. I yeah. wanted to pass out and then do it again. And yeah. We were supposed to have a house party that night. And um, I remember I did, I drank that bottle so fast and I did all the dilated and meth that I had that was supposed to last me days. And um, I was totally present. And that was like the worst feeling in the world. Cause yeah. I looked at like what was on the, table I was sitting on my death couch and I call it my death couch because that's why I was killing myself you know yeah. and it was just like anybody that does this much should either be out of their mind or unconscious and I was totally present and it was like finally that equation of William plus substances was not giving me that peace and it was causing me a lot more pain and I remember people started to come over to our house at that point and I was just like I can't do this and I went in my bedroom and I laid in my bed and I cried mm -hmm. and I prayed for God to change me just over and over like do whatever you have to do and I had a pain like in my the marrow of my bones. Like yeah. I don't want to forget that pain because that was more painful than any like anything physical I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, I worked at a Japanese steakhouse. You know where they cook in front of mm -hmm. you, and it was fun. It was it was an awesome place to work. And um, I was so intoxicated that night. I uh, I almost fell on one of the grills. They're like 800 degrees. I cleared out a whole line of martini glasses, mm -hmm. and. Um, the hard thing was, is I, my brother had just, I just got him a job as a busboy there. So he got to watch me the whole night. And, um, and like in the service station, it was like, they're all like, man, you see how fucked up Bill is tonight? Right. And, uh, and I was, at first I was mad. I was like, why are they talking shit? Yeah. 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 And then they, I was like, they're not even lying. They're no. just being honest. Like, right. I'm fucked up. Right. And, um, I was like, I'm going to get fired. Cause I'd already been suspended twice for this job. One time I, uh, am, in my defense, it was Halloween. I was dressed as a zombie. I'd bitten one of the bartenders extremely hard. Oh. So I got suspended for that. And then um, I stabbed another employee with chopsticks on a separate occasion because he offered to drive me home when I was too drunk. And uh, so I got fired that night. And I, and I was totally okay with it. I think that was one of the things that scared me because I was like, you can't have this stuff in your business. Like, right. this is terrible for your business. Right, right. Yeah, you're like, I got fired from a job as a manager, passed out in the walk-in cooler. Oh, damn. So, yeah. <laughs> they so, found me like 45 minutes worth, John. <laughs> you're probably sleeping like a baby. I was. Yeah. Right. Nice and cool in there. <laughs> I know, feeling well, man. And then, so the next day I'm driving and I get pulled over and the state highway patrolman's like, hey, like your tags are expired. And I was like, and I knew this, I knew this. And I was like, so am I going to get like, a, how much is a ticket or whatever? And she's like, Oh no, no, we're going to impound your car. It's like a year and a half over. So I was like, dang, that sucks. So I called up waitress number two to pick me up out of the back of the state highway patrol's car. 
and um i was just like i don't know why i was honest with this girl but i was like i really don't like where my life is right now and i don't know how to fix it and uh she went and dropped me off at my parents house i was like just drop me off there and um I was doing some yard work for him, and all I could think about was going into their woods and killing myself. Mm-hmm. And um, my plan was is I was gonna sell my Les Paul and uh, try to overdose the following weekend. And then if that didn't work, I was gonna shoot myself in my parents' woods. That mm-hmm. was like really where I was at. And um, I don't know why, but I was smoking a cigarette. And my dad came up to me and he was just like, "What's up with you, man? Like you don't seem like yourself." I was like. Well, I hate myself, I hate my life, and I don't know how to fix it. And he walked away because he was just so frustrated because he'd been able to see me be successful in areas mm-hmm. in my life, and he just didn't understand why I couldn't just leave the drugs right. and alcohol. And right. um, I went up on the back porch, and um, I'm so thankful my mom was involved with al for about almost two years at this point. Wow. And um, I was just honest with her, and, um, and she had built relationships and got, um, she had somebody, um, that was in a treatment center here, Wilson Hall down in Maslin. Yep. And um, in the following day, we went and did the interview. And, um, and I remember in that interview, I was explaining to him how much I drank and used. And um, he said to me, I don't see you making it another year at this rate. Right. And I was like, I don't think I'm that bad. And my mom's like sobbing next to me, right? And it's like, that's one of the, the like that flight from reality and addiction. Like I couldn't see myself like where I was. And even though I had these feelings and these ideas, like I could not see myself objectively or honestly. And um, I don't know why, but I did, I agreed to go to treatment um, on Thursday, July 4th, 2013. And that's my sobriety date. And um, the reason why I share that like story from Thursday to Thursday is uh, it's not like it's any, any worse or any like more debauchery than any other time in my drinking and using but i really believe there's like sometimes people see like there's a picture of jesus where he's carrying around a black sheep and sometimes mm-hmm. he has it around his shoulders yep. but the story goes with that is uh if back in those days if a sheep would continue to stray from the flock the shepherd would actually break its legs so it wouldn't get picked off yeah. but when the flock would move the shepherd would have to carry it obviously because right. the legs were broken yeah. but um and it builds such a bond with the shepherd at that point. And I really believe, like when I said that prayer on Thursday, the God of my understanding was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And he had to take away the job, the car, the girls. He, like he had to, cause I'm the type of addict and alcoholic. If I have a card to play, you can't tell me anything. You can come to me with love and reason, but I'm not gonna listen. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he did that for me in a week, what I've been trying to do for years. Right. So, right. yeah. One of the things that I did when I got out of treatment was I took my cell phone and I deleted all my contacts out, mm-hmm. except for like my family. So I had like, I went from, I don't know, 350 some contacts down to 15. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of made a deal with myself. Like if somebody from my past life reached out, I'd tell them exactly what I was doing. Like, hey, I'm sober, I'm clean. Like I'm trying to go that way. And the crazy thing was, is like, I don't think I got contacted by 200 of them. Right. And the other, so I reached out, it was one of two responses. It was either amazing, how can I support you? Or, okay, best of luck. And it was like, I was killing their vibe and mm-hmm. their buzz. So and like, I have no ill will towards them, but the people that have come back, at, like that are in my phone now, like I feel there's so many I could call that would be there day or night for me and my family. And that's yeah. totally different than what I lived like before. It is a, it is definitely a change, that's for sure. Yeah. What that's dreams scary. have come true for you? Oh, sorry, I'll finish. No, what? no. What dreams have come true for you? What dreams? Uh, I would say I'm living the American dream, but I didn't feel like that was a possibility for me. I didn't think having a stable relationship. My relationships lasted a year and a half. That's Mm. what they were. Because I would be like a good boy for six months. Then I'd start doing my own thing for six. And then it was set it on fire for the last Mm. six. That's Mm. the way I ran it. And I didn't think marriage was possible for me. And... I love my wife today and the relationship we have. I didn't think home ownership was a possibility for me. And, you know, we bought our home five years ago and it's, we have two dogs and three acres and yeah, like I love mowing my yard. It takes me two and a half hours, but I'm out there like (laughs) we're mowing my yard with my mower Mm -hmm. and like, I'm loving it. And like, uh, having a career, like 
that's not something I thought was possible for somebody like me. It was typically nine to 12 months. That was my, that I could last somewhere. Yeah. And now I think I've turned down more jobs in sobriety than I have had yes. in the past. Yeah. And that's really, um, yeah, that would be something that's really impactful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, what hopes do you have for the future? Good question. I hope to continue to grow in recovery because I think this is one of those things where there's no there's no complacency. It's like anything in nature. It's either in like a growing season or a dying season. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to stay active because it's what's gotten me to this point and I want to continue to grow so I want to be the best father I can be I want to be the best husband I can be I want to be the best brother and son and friend and employee um, I'd like to have my own business eventually mm -hmm. I've, I have some ideas and some opportunities but yeah it's like those possibilities are all out there as long as I continue to put in the work I need to absolutely yeah um, what are some intangible and tangible gifts that you've received in your recovery? Tangible and intangible. The, but the tangibles are easy, I would say. They're, I don't know, the cool cars that I've had and the cool truck I have and like the house and the toys, yeah. like all this stuff. Those are cool. Those are nice, but really those can come and go. But the intangible are the relationships. I mean, those, those mean so much to me. They mean so much more to me now that I understand what it takes to maintain a relationship. It takes effort on both sides and it takes commitment and honesty and love and understanding and mm. compromise. Mm. And those are things I could give you a definition for, but I didn't know how to live them. Yeah. And now like I've had some practice in doing that mm -hmm. and it's, and that's powerful to know yeah. like you're supported by a community and you're supported by your family and your friends and it's mm -hmm. like, yeah awesome um what have you learned from your addiction uh, mm. that's a good one what I i've learned a lot about myself yeah, I think in working the steps, they gave me tremendous insight into myself. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, like on the resentment side of things, that I have a lot more to say in how my life goes. I thought a lot of things happened to me and I had no part in it, but in reality, I put myself in situations for things that happened. I stepped on people's toes and they retaliated. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, those things just happen, but they don't happen by happy chance. The other thing in the step work is being able to know myself. Uh, my favorite lie is lie by omission, mm -hmm. for sure. It's not like I'm gonna lie straight to your face, yeah. but I'm gonna leave out really important information mm -hmm. you should probably know. Mm -hmm. um, perfectionism is not a character, do you, it's not a character trait I wish to embody anymore. Right. I can pursue excellence in my life. I can clearly define an expectation and a goal for myself yeah. and pursue those things but perfectionism is not useful for me today. And um, the other one that's a paradox is I am able to take a tremendous amount of pain, but I do not like pain at all. Mm. And I think that's why I was this escapism with opiates and alcohol was like, it killed the pain for a period of time because I was super sensitive. But, um, and I think I am sensitive. I, and that was something I was, I was not willing to admit when I wasn't, before I got sober, but mm. I'm a sensitive person. Like I'm, sensitive to how you feel about me or how I feel about you and mm -hmm. that's okay dealing with those things is much more it's actually a gift not a curse Absolutely. or a hindrance so I think that's really no that's really good I mean it does it changes mm -hmm. it changes everything yeah is there anything that we missed that you'd like to share or, or go over with us um I would like to share like the commitment side of it. Yeah. I think something that's, it's kind of heartbreaking for me when I see in recovery is like a half steps and half measures in the program. And I don't know why, but I was 
beaten up enough that I was willing to like give it everything at that point in time. And like I had the circumstances being in treatment that I could commit. And like I spent three months in treatment and then another eight months in transitional housing. And I thought I was going to fix myself in like 28 days, like Sandra Bullock. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get the plant, get the dog, and then like yeah. everything would be better. Mm -hmm. And it's like I needed every one of those 11 months to get to where I was, be okay on my own, like start living on my own. Mm -hmm. And I've needed every meeting since then to maintain my sobriety. Mm -hmm. And I think the hard thing is it took me a minute to realize this, but like I pursued drugs and alcohol with such a fervor, like I needed that in my recovery and I still need it today. And um, I just wanna encourage people, like this is the biggest investment you can make in yourself. Don't halfway do it. Like, go for it like you the, and I think this is one of those games it's not like if you show up for a half day of work you get a half day's pay if you do a half day's work in recovery you get nothing mm -hmm. and, it's, and that's been my experience too when I halfway do things and I'm not in it like I don't get that return but when I give everything I can honestly and wholeheartedly I get back tenfold mm -hmm. that's the that's the paradox of this and I think it's one of the things that can be really frustrating to newcomers is they get in they do a little bit and they expect a little bit back and that's not the way right. this it's it's an all or nothing game unfortunately and um and the other side of that is like man it's really hard when you lose friends and that you know you see them either get it for a little bit or they just never fully get it and you lose them and they lose that opportunity so if you have that today like you have such a gift there's so many others that don't have that opportunity and um just like it's a really precious gift Oh. We appreciate you coming out today to the first Friday event in Canton, Ohio. Your story is going to help so many people who think they're alone and that there is no hope. You are proof that there is a way out of addiction. Awesome. Thank thanks, you John. so much. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Cool.